you cannot change religion. You have to get rid of religion. Religion will not give you equality and justice because religion was not made for equality and justice. Mm. You don't get trade unions taking to the street and trying to campaign against mm. uh, the extension of anti-discrimination rights to gay people. Uh, you don't get a lot of civil society NGOs taking to the streets and lobbying uh, to try and prevent the equal treatment um, of gay people. The groups that oppose it are religious ones. Mm. You don't get atheists uh, standing up in the national parliament, or at least we didn't in Britain, and saying, because I am an atheist, uh, or because I am a humanist, because of my beliefs, I reject the idea of equal treatment uh, for uh, same-sex couples or gay people. And I represent many, many homosexual, LGBT, transgender people in uh, the religions. And we would like to keep our religions, but we would like to change them. Even though I'm not homosexual, I support the cause. I demand their human rights not only in Europe, but all over the world. Homosexuals have been suffering because of patriarchal tradition and culture and religious dogma. Today I will tell you how I suffer because of religion. I was born in a Muslim family. It was usual for us children in the early morning to read the Quran in Arabic. And like all other children in Bangladesh, I did this. But I found myself asking questions. I wanted to know what I was reading, what the meaning of the Quranic verses was. <coughs> Our language is Bengali, not Arabic. And it was impossible to know the meaning of the verses that we read. We just read, that's all. When I asked my mother to tell me the meaning of what I was reading, she explained that the meaning is not important that what is important is that Allah will be happy that I'm reading the Quran in its original language. When I was 13 or 14, however, I found a book that translated the Quran into Bengali. To my surprise, I found Allah saying that men are superior and women are inferior. Men can have four wives, men can divorce their wives anytime they want, men are allowed to be to women, Women are not allowed to give testimony in some legal cases. I realized that Islam does not consider women a separate human being. Man was the original creation and womankind was created secondarily for the pleasure of man. Islam considers a woman as a slave or sexual object, nothing more. Women's role is to stay at home and to obey her husband, for this is her religious duty. Women are considered weak, so they should be taken care of. Their body and mind, their desire and wishes, their rights and freedom must be controlled by men. Islam tr treats women intellectually, morally, and physically inferior. In marriage, Islam protects the rights of men and men only. Once the marriage is consummated, women have no rights whatsoever in this field. The Quran gave the total freedom to men, saying, your, your women are as your field. Go unto them as you will. Women are told to run to their husbands what, wherever they are, whatever they do. It is their duty. The Hadith says that the two prayers that never reach the heavens are number one, those of the escaping slaves, and number two, those of the reluctant women who frustrate their husbands at night. Islam considers women psychologically inferior. Women's testimony is not allowed in cases of marriage, divorce, and hudud. Hudud are the punishment of Islamic law for adultery, fornication, adultery against a married person, apostasy, theft, robbery, and so forth. If any woman is raped, she has to produce four male witnesses to the court. If she can't, there is no charge against the rapist. In Islamic law, the testimony of two women is worth that of one man. In the case in which a man suspects his wife of adultery, 
or denies the legitimacy of the offspring, his testimony is worth that of four witnesses. A woman does not have the right to charge her husband in a similar manner. Women are not allowed to inherit the property equally with their brothers. In the cases of inheritance, in the case of inheritance, Allah says, a male shall inherit twice as much as a female. And after all the rights and freedom, after getting all the sexual pleasure and pleasure of being the master, Allah will reward the man with wine, food, and 72 virgins in paradise, including their wives on the earth. And what is the reward for the pious woman? Nothing. Nothing but the same old husband, the same man who caused her suffering while they were on earth. Growing up, I naturally had the belief that girls surely must be inferior to boys, for boys could play in a big field wherever, whereas the girls had to play with their dolls in a corner of the house. My brothers could go anywhere they wanted, could watch any games, could play anything they wanted to play. I couldn't. My sister could not. I was told that girls were not made for such, that their role was to stay home, learn how to cook, make beds, clean the house. My mother was not the only woman who was oppressed, for I saw that my aunts, my neighbors, and other acquaintances who were playing the same roles, that of being oppressed. In our minds, torture of women is not oppression, but rather it's tradition. We become accustomed to tradition. As I grew, I realized that I was a part of of the tradition, but also that I was being oppressed the same as my female classmates and uh, later my female patients. I realized that whether <coughs> women are poor or rich, beautiful or ugly, have blue or black or brown eyes, have white, black or brown skin, they are unmarried or married, illiterate or literate, clever or not, all are oppressed. Everywhere women are oppressed, and all because of patriarchy, religion, tradition, culture, and customs. Nobody told me to protest, but I developed a strong feeling that it is important to fight against oppression. Nobody asked me to shed a tear, but I did. I continued writing. In my poetry, prose, and essays, novels, I have defended women and the religious and ethnic minority community that are being oppressed. I cried loudly for equality and justice, justice for all people, whatever their religion or gender. I spoke loudly on behalf of secularism. I spoke against any religious laws in which women are oppressed. My books are getting banned by the government. Women continue to be flogged, they are stoned to death, women are raped and are accused of allowing the rape and the rapists are set free. Women have been suffering from trafficking, from slavery, from all sorts of discrimination. Men have thrown acid <coughs> on women's face and walked away as happy men. Women are not considered as human beings, not by religion, not by tradition. For a couple, the most unwanted thing is a female baby. If a female baby is born, either the wife gets a divorce from her, for her crime of having given birth of a female, or the wife must spend her life with disgrace. By writing books, I wanted to do something constructive. I wanted to help women understand that they are oppressed. I wanted to encourage them to fight for their rights and freedom. My voice, however, gave women the chance to think differently. That, however, did not make the religionists and the male chauvinists happy. As a result, the religious fundamentalists took the stand of absolutely not tolerating any of my views. They objected to women's breaking the chains and becoming free, and they could not tolerate my saying that the Quran is out of place and out of time, and the secular law with the, moderns, with the uniform civil code for women is a necessity. The religious fundamentalists broke into newspapers, offices, sued my editors, publishers, and me. They demanded my execution by hanging. Mm. Hundreds of thousands of people were on the street. They called a general strike all over the country, insisting that I be killed. The governments, instead of taking action against them, took action against me. They filed a case against me, charging that I had hurt the religious feelings of the people. I had no other alternative but to go into hiding 
Ultimately, the government threw me out of the country. Since then, I have been trying to go back to my country, but it is impossible. I've been living in exile for 14 years. <coughs> Meanwhile, five of my books are banned in Bangladesh. I've written more than 30 books, and cases have been filed against me in order to ban the other books. A few years, a few years ago, the Bangladesh court sentenced me to one year in prison for having written what I did. I believe it is dangerous to follow the religious scripture in the modern world, not only the Quran. All the religious scriptures are out of time, out of place. I have been writing about all these, but my freedom of expression has been cons continuously violated by the authority. I could not reach the readers of my country. Four parts of my autobiography are banned in my country. My autobiography, I realize, is not just my life story. It is the same story that thousands of women know about. It tells how Muslim women live in a patriarchal society that has hundreds of traditions in which girls and women suffer. I have looked back into my childhood days and described the life of being a female child, told how I was brought up, explained that I had privileges that many others didn't have. I was able to study and become a medical doctor, something which thousands of girls cannot even dream about. I wanted to show where and how I grew up and what made me think differently, what made me do things differently. It is important to give other women some strength to revolt against the oppressive system that I grew up under and which still continues for them. I told the truth. I expressed everything that happened in my life. Normally it is taboo to reveal rape or attempted rape by male members of one's family. Girls shut their mouth because they are terribly ashamed but I did not shut my mouth. I did not care what people would say to me or to my family. I know well that many women feel that I am telling their untold stories too. We, the victims, should cry out loud. We need to be heard. We must protest loudly and demand our freedom and rights. We must refuse to be shackled, chained, beaten, <coughs> and threatened. We have only one life and we demand to live it in happiness. My story is not a unique one. My experiences, unfortunately, have been shared by millions of fellow sufferers. In my book, I cried for myself. I also cried for, the, for all the others who have, been, who have not been able to enjoy the productive life of which they are capable and which they most assuredly deserve. We who are women no longer must remain solitary, crying softly in lonely places. When I, when I was forced to leave Bangladesh, free thinkers, free thinking intellectuals from all over the world stood by me. I moved to Europe, not out of choice. I was forced to. I always wanted to return to my own land, but you know that was, I was not allowed to do so. Even when my mother was on her deathbed, the Bangladeshi government told me I could not return. A few years after that, when my father lay dying, I begged, pleaded, and cried to be allowed to see him if only for two days. The government of Bangladesh refused to allow my entry. They refused to renew my passport. For 10 long years, I wandered from one European country to the next. I sought a home, but found none. I felt like an outsider everywhere, an alien in the truest sense. How can one live in a society knowing that it is not one's own? I always wanted to return home, always. Since I knew that it was not possible, I wanted to go to India. I would at least get a taste of home in India, but India kept her doors firmly shut for six years. When I was finally given, given permission, I did not waste a moment. I thought West Bengal of India would be my new home. Even though I dream of a utopia in which there will be peace, and harmonious existence, I know there is no escaping those who wish to trap their fellow human beings to make them suffer, those who oppose human rights and women's rights and rights to freedom of thought and expression. Such individuals cling to their own pity notions of religion, narrow-mindedness, hatred, and superstition as they feel it is necessary for their survival. That is why a group of fundamentalists issued fatwa against me, set price on my head, and shouted to Slima, go back. And, and, and an absolutely ineffectual government then asked me to pack my bags and leave India. 
For four months, I was kept under virtual houses by, by the government of West Bengal. And then I was thrown out of West Bengal. The national government was forced to take charge of me. They again placed me under virtual house arrest. I did not even have the right to meet any of my friends. I had no right to step out even for a moment. I spent a miserable existence of this kind for over three months, total seven and a half months. But where, I, where was I to go? If I could have gone back to Bangladesh, I would have. I do not want to live in either Europe or America, India, which prides itself on being the world's largest democracy and allegedly secular state could not shelter me, a person whose entire life has been spent in the cause of secular humanism. A person without a land or a home who regarded India as her land and called Calcutta as her home, who, uh, who as a Bengali writer wanted to live in a Bengali environment surrounded by her own language and culture, was this too much to ask for? I was amazed that not a single political party, organization, or, or institution protested against the way in which I had been treated. Not even individuals regarded as the standard bearers of secularism spoke up, spoke up for me. Unfortunately, in India, if one is to be secular or progressive, one must be a little pro-Muslim or pro-Islam. One must not talk anything against Muslim fundamentalists, even if they issue fatwa against women or writers and set price on their head. One secular Indian must not talk against a Muslim because Muslims are minority in that country and because a minority could, not, could be oppressed by the majority community, so all Muslims should be defended whatever their crime. If Muslim fundamentalists demand Muslim laws, that are definitely anti-women, secular Indians appear to appreciate it in the name of multiculturalism or in the name of defending Muslims. The hypocrisy is mind-boggling. And I know that this is not only the problem in India, the problem is increasing in Europe too. Today, I'm homeless, homeless everywhere. Why? Is there, if there is no freedom of speech in an Islamic society, uh, is there any hope of progress if there is no freedom of speech in an Islamic society? I don't think there is any hope of progress. Should the right to oppose Islam not exist? If an Islamic society does not check fundamentalism within itself, are we to assume that the notion of moderate or progressive people in Islamic <coughs> society is nothing but a pretense? How many moderate Muslims have opposed the numerous fatwas that fundamentalists throughout the world are ha handing out? How many moderate Muslims have opposed the heinous acts of cruelty being perpetrated, perpetrated on women by fundamentalists? Where are the women for, tho for whose sake and writing on whose behalf and writing on whose behalf I had to undergo so much trauma? I have not seen too many of them opposing what is being done to me or taking a stance on my behalf. Actually, I think that uh, if you believe in religion, you cannot oppose the fundamentalists because it is my, my belief that there is no difference between religion and fundamentalism. Religion is not only hotbed of ignorance, inequality, injustice, and misogyny. It is also a hotbed of homophobia. We who believe in equality and justice, we all should fight for women's rights as well as homosexuals' rights. Actually, these are human rights and our human rights, these are human rights and our human rights have been violated for too long. I can assure my homosexual friend, friends that I will fight for their rights until my death. We must work for freedom of expression and for, free, for human rights for all. Come what may, I will never be silenced. I'm homeless. It is true that I'm truly homeless, but I have a home. I believe I have a home, a home that consists of family of people, men as well as women, who bravely oppose the forces of darkness and ignorance are my true home. 
The hearts of people are my home, my only safe haven, my shelter and my refuge. There is no place in this wide world which I can call my home. But you who support me, sympathize with me, express solidarity with me, you are my home, my country. Thank you very much. I hope that you all will get a piece of paper where it's uh, a little bit old-fashioned written LG religion and LGBT rights, time for marriage. Have you got it? Yes, it's coming. Yeah, uh, it's distributed there too. Yeah. So you can follow my argument. But uh, today I would like to say thank you to Taslima so much for your presentation. I, I really value what you are sharing. And I have faith that we one day will uh, see difference in religion around the world. And um, I argue for changing religion, not uh, abandoning religion. My argument is for changing religion. And therefore I would like to make a tribute, as I am a defender of faiths here today, I will not speak for Muslims or for anyone, uh, for Jews or for anyone else, but I will make some arguments and references also to other faiths, as I'm the only one representing faiths. Uh, so take it for what it is. It comes from a Christian, lesbian, social democratic background. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I am aware of my limitations, that I cannot speak for others. But I would like to make a tribute to Mas Mahmoud Mohammed Taha. Mahmoud Mohammed Taha was the one to be the great reformer of Islam. He was hanged by Nimeri in uh, Sudan in the 60s. And he, his, uh, his way of dealing with Islam was that it's an interpretation. Interpretation had to be made in every time by every people. And you have to use reason, freedom, your rights, everything. He was hanged, but his thoughts were not stopped. Today he has a disciple in, uh, in uh, the United States, uh, Abdullah Anaim which is uh, writing uh, very interesting books on Islam and human rights. And I would like to ask you also to, to read this information about how religion like Islam, which is a younger religion than Jewish and Christian and Buddhist and Hindu faith, uh, is uh, dealing with its uh, uh, scriptures and its uh, heritage. So now to the argument here. Religion and LGBTI rights, time for marriage. That's my question. Religion is not the bed, but it's a bed of homophobia. There are many other beds as well of homophobia. But of course, religion is a very serious problem to lesbians, gays, and all others who experience uh, oppression and minority status in a world which is uh, not eager to deal with the other. Uh, homophobia is related to so social conditions at large. I will make some arguments about that from Johan Galtung and also from uh, the World Value Study. And thirdly, your Jakarta principles, which is the human rights framework worked out by many good people in Yogyakarta is a, a city or town in uh, Indonesia and uh, it's how they mean that the human rights framework can be used for gender rights and sexual orientation rights. And my argument is that Yogyakarta principles, which is a very good framework for our rights, is uh, needs to be supported by cultural and religious values. My argument is simply this. You don't like politics. It doesn't mean that you stop politics. My argument is the same. You don't like religions. It doesn't mean you stop religion. It means you change it. One, religion is not the hotbed of homophobia, but it's a hotbed of homophobia. And my argument is simply from the European history Atheism is as dangerous as religions. Mm. 
Uh, we know it from Nazi Germany, we know it from Stalin terror, we know it from the experiments with the atheism and, uh, and the very secularist uh, ideology of the states. And uh, those, uh, those uh, babes are no less hot than uh, any other babes. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> religion, atheism, there is no easy way, there is no shortcut in this world to a good human life. There is no shortcut. Uh, re secondly, religions are not unitary and uniform, but carriers of many practices and many interpretations. <coughs> I argue for a battle of interpretation, and we have to win that battle, not to lay down our arms. We have to win the battle. I'm sorry for f speaking so violently, but, but it's, it's really a battle. And uh, thirdly, it's not religion intrinsically or per se or in itself, if there is something as in itself. But uh, my point is that it's specific interpretations of religion that are homophobic, uh, at least uh, in the context where I live. Uh, so I go to the second argument. argument. It is that homophobia is related to societal conditions at large. And here I build on Ronald Engelhardt and uh, Pippa Norris, who have written a book called Rising Tide, Gender Equality and Cultural Change Around the World, uh, the year 2003. Uh, they distinguish between agricultural societies, industrial societies, and post-industrial societies. Uh, the agricultural societies are 97 countries around the world with very low gross national product and very low HDI, Human Development Index. It means that life is hard. It's a struggle for survival in these agricultural societies. In all of them, there is tremendously lot of homophobia, and there is no space for individual freedom. <coughs> Very little. In the 21 post-industrial societies, which have a more high HDI and a GNP, uh, if you ask young women in Sweden today about uh, homosexuality, that when they come to be confirmed in the confirmation classes, their question is, uh, of course everyone should be married in the church, should be able to be married in the church, lesbians and gays and anyone who would like to. That's their absolute uh, uh, stand. And uh, it's like that in most post-industrial societies that the young generation is free from uh, discrimination to a large extent that our generations and older generations are not. But in the industrial societies, they are 58. The post-industrial societies are only 21. And that's also those countries where you find the same-sex legislation and so on. In the 58 industrial countries, it's a little bit in-between situation and there is a little bit more space for the individual. Um, so what I mean is that uh, it depends on which society you live in. And uh, things go together. Uh, if you have to struggle for survival, there is not much space for individual freedom rights. But if you have solved the struggle for survival item, there is much more space for our freedom. Uh, my second line of argument on that point, that it's a society's conditions at large that determine the extent of homophobia, comes from uh, this little picture I have of an iceberg. It's Johan Galto from Norway, the peace researcher, who have researched on the grammar of violence. And that is uh, that there is direct violence if anyone hits somebody, like hate crime or hate speech, for example. But there is also structural violence, which is, for example, legislation and economic political structures. And there is the uh, cultural violence, which Taslima described so eloquently. 
uh, and the cultural violence is of course including the religious violence. And um, Galtung says that the direct violence you can change rather quickly. The structural violence, it takes some years. Barbo will tell about that. It takes some time also for politics to develop a good legislation. And thirdly, the cultural violence is the one that is most difficult to change. It changes more slowly, but once it has changed, it's a fantastic ally. Uh, so you can say that the cultural violence determines the climate in which the iceberg can melt. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, um, <coughs> it, is, uh, it is important the way that religions are situated and the way that religions are interpreted. But uh, it's not the sole uh, factor determining homophobia. It's, uh, it works together. And if you want to change, you have to work together on all these fronts in order to uh, effect change in the society. And I am interested in change. Thirdly, for Yogyakarta principles, the LGBT human rights framework to be well-grounded, they need to be supported by cultural and religious values. Therefore, I mean, and maybe Kisto does not agree with me here, but the, my argument is that it's dangerous to isolate religion from the claim of change. Uh, as a lesbian, as belonging to a, to, a, to a movement that is very much oppressed around the world, we need changed religions. Uh, and uh, maybe you can help us with this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I will give you some examples of religion as a cultural resource for dissolving homophobia. You have heard a lot of, about how religion is used for expressing and cultivating homophobia. But can we use religion for dissolving homophobia? That's my question. With gay people being Christian, being Muslim, being Buddhist, and so on, there comes a whole wealth of literature on how we religious gay and lesbian and LGBTI people try to change our religions. And there, so you can go to Google and find out many, many things. I would like to share today one finding which is very important for Jewish, Christian, and Muslim faith. You know that an old name for homophobia was uh, sodomy. Or do you say that in English? Yeah. Andrew, sodomy. I don't, I don't know the word for homosexuality. Yeah, an old word for homosexuality is sodomy. And of course, it <coughs> etymologically comes from Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. Yeah. And if you say Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, they were sinful and therefore they were destroyed because they were homosexual. Yes, that is uh, what is heard. What now we have found with the help, help of Jewish scholars is that until the year 1000, it means for more than 1000 years, the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah was never interpreted as related to homosexuality. Never. What was the great sin? The sin was xenophobia, the ill treatment of the stranger. And you can find that in the Talmud and in a book by Bertil Adania in Sweden called Midrash, reading the Bible in between the lines. It's very important research because which is the strongest element against homophobia in Islam and in the Quran? Yes. It is the story about Sodom and Gomorrah. I do not argue that the Bible, the scriptures, are not homophobic and are part of homophobic traditions. That's not my point. What I say is there is a whole lot of things to do to, to liberate the scriptures into a work for human rights and for lesbian and gay rights and all others' rights. <coughs> 
Uh, one more example. Religion can be a resource for diversity and manifoldness. For example, when the two visitors come to Sarah, the three visitors come to Sarah and Abraham, they are called strangers. It's three strangers that come and visit in Hebron. It means that from the very early pages of the Bible, God is revealed in the strangers, in a community of strangers. There is a lot of resources for manifoldness, diversity, uh, and I would say that homophobia is not the fear of the same, as the Greek word says. It's not the fear of the same, it's fear of the other. And therefore, the Bible warns us against not taking care of the stranger. And that is a very great sin in all traditions. And therefore, I think there are fragments, there are possibilities of taking the tools out of the hand of those who would like to work for homophobia. Uh, I could mention many more things. I stop here. You have got my point. When you don't like religion, you don't stop religion. You change it. Yes, I had jotted down <coughs> some yes. things uh, I wanted to say. And then listening to Taslima and Anna Karin, I, 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 I threw it away. <laughs> so, what did I learn? Well, in 1979, um, when I was, uh, uh, I had been Director General of the National Board of Health and Welfare for three or four weeks. Uh, the stairs of uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, board were occupied, uh, and the reason was uh, uh, that that uh, RFSL and uh, the the gay members uh, wanted to get rid of that. Uh, 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 homosexuality as disease in the classification of diseases. And at that time I knew uh, 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 almost nothing about uh, gay questions. And, uh, but I knew that the world is lacking love and that love between people should be promoted and could not be seen as a disease. So I promised to get rid of that uh, uh, number for so homosexuality in the classification. And during the two following months, I learned a lot which was important later. Um, and that was uh, uh, the reality of homophobia, uh, reality of harassment, of, uh, of violence, uh, losing jobs, etc., etc., and uh, uh, that uh, was a very good lesson when receiving afterwards letters from people belonging to different churches um, uh, showing their hatred towards me uh, because I got so angry with those letters. So it, it, uh, I thought this is an important question question to go on with. And uh, of course there were people f from, from uh, various churches, but there were also other people, um, uh, extreme uh, people in politics and, and so on. There was a variety. And uh, in the middle of this I met Ludwig Jönsson. He uh, uh, was heading the parish of the old town here in Stockholm. And we started to talk about uh, the role of the church here. And uh, he was a very brave man and said, uh, we have to collaborate. So he invited gay people to the Holy Communion. And that was new, that hadn't been done in Sweden, uh, to come to his church and, uh, 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 and uh, join him in the Holy Communion. And uh, of course, uh, he, he was uh, uh, very much criticized for this, so much that there was one church uh, which recommended its members to pray to God, to curse him, to ban him, to do evil things towards him. 
And unfortunately, and this should be done uh, during one month, and unfortunately, he died during that month. And you know, for that church, this was her victory. Uh, I met that church later. I'll come to this. But, but these reactions uh, uh, then, uh, of course, motivated me during uh, 1982 when HIV uh, was, was uh, uh, apparent and that uh, gay people were a risk group and uh, people, uh, uh, homophobic people came up and said, this is God's punishment. Look here, they are hit by, 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 by this uh, deathly disease. And uh, to, to tell uh, that this is, uh, it's nothing God's doing. Uh, it's a disease which is new and so on, and I'll not go into this. Then um, the, the next phase was, of course, when I headed the, the uh, uh, parliamentary group preparing for partnership. Um, it was uh, the, the most queer uh, uh, um, um, thing I've been participating in uh, because uh, there were uh, three parties uh, in government opposing partnership. My own party, the Liberal Party, was split. Uh, those uh, members of the Liberal Party living in the Bible belts of Sweden were opposing and we who lived in the big cities uh, were, uh, were in favour. And then there was uh, the, the, the left party and the social democrats, they were all for it. Uh, we struggled with this, um, uh, the, this uh, uh, group, uh, parliamentary committee, for three years. And uh, during this time, the number of letters coming the, uh, from the religious groups, there were of two kinds. Uh, one kind was people who pitied me, who had the, the, the view that partnership should uh, become a reality in Sweden. Some prayed to God, someone went to the Archbishop and asked him to pray for me that I should change my mind. Mm -hmm. Then there were the others <laughs> showing pure hatred. And uh, as Ludwig Jönsson experienced this um, church uh, um, praying to God for a month uh, to curse me, to ban me, um, I happened to get the disease Legionella which is a rather severe one, <laughs> lying there in the hospital for infectious diseases. Well, I'm almost there. Uh, uh, I, I have to survive. I have to show them they're wrong. Uh, before uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, decision um, taken by Parliament, for 24 hours, these churches were praying outside Parliament to uh, that, that the parliament should say no to this and there, of course there were some 70 votes in favor uh, in uh, uh, majority the difference was so we succeeded <coughs> but during this time what i learned was that it was important that a priest like anna karin uh, in the, the the swedish church showed themselves came up and defended uh, the, the idea of partnership. And I think now moving on to, to marriage in churches, it's so important that we as politicians can collaborate with members who are mem in, within the family. That's the way I think we can change things. I, I agree very much with you that, that there is a hope. You can change, but you have to find your friends in the group uh, where you also have your enemies. And then finally, interpretation of Bibles and legislation. Uh, I find quite often that the, le the laws which we decide on in Parliament, when they are implemented, they are misread. They are used in a way that we never thought of. And, and the s same thing is with, the, with all these Bibles. That, uh, and we got a pr an evidence here with Sodom and Gomorrah that there are, there are people, there are humans who misinterpret. And why? Is it that it's something 
unfamiliar they have to deal with, they are scared, and in order to be secure, they, 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 they interpret things wrongly. My last minute is gone, so I'll come back in the debate there. I could go on for hours. <laughs> Thank you. The first thing I want to say is that um, I think it's great that there are people uh, within churches and within religions uh, working to change their, the attitudes of their co-religionists, the attitudes of their organisations. And in Ghana we've worked ourselves with uh, gay Muslim groups, gay Christian groups uh, in Britain. Uh, but I don't think it has any bearing necessarily on the question uh, of whether or not religions themselves uh, have been and are hotbeds of homophobia. And I think um, they undoubtedly are. And I'd go further to say they are probably the main, and in Europe today definitely, uh, the main and principal um, hotbed of homophobia. We can look at the map of the world um, and we can see uh, the darker purple coloured countries there that sort of uh, appear in the middle of the map are the countries um, with the death penalty uh, for same-sex sex. And um, those countries, of course, uh, uniformly across the, the centre band there, are countries that have uh, very large Muslim populations and quite Islamist um, governments, obviously, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you look at the countries slightly better off, but not uh, that much better off, um, perhaps that run uh, across Africa, um, or perhaps the subcontinent, and you find that, again, although death, uh, or state-sponsored death, at least, uh, is not a risk uh, for you in those countries, um, there's a lot of persecution, there are uh, legal uh, constraints against you, and what you're doing is illegal. Um, and again, a lot of these legal codes are inherited uh, from uh, European Protestant uh, legal codes that were imposed on various uh, colonial or uh, uh, colonial countries again religiously inspired uh, reverse now perhaps uh, in Europe uh, but remaining across the world religion has been uh, very much uh, the origin of most of the persecution uh, of gay people uh, in the world and today um, I don't think the situation has changed uh, we've had um, many advances, many legal advances made in Europe. In Britain, Gala has been part of uh, campaigning for our own civil partnership laws, which we have, uh, for laws against discrimination, um, for laws against the incitement of hatred uh, on grounds of sexual orientation. And every time, of course, there has been opposition uh, from society and from uh, the country. And the organisations that have been opposing it are religious ones. You don't get trade unions taking to the street and trying to campaign against mm -hmm. uh, the extension of anti-discrimination rights to gay people. Uh, you don't get a lot of civil society NGOs taking to the streets and lobbying uh, to try and prevent the equal treatment um, of gay people. The groups that oppose it are religious ones. Mm -hmm. You don't get atheists uh, standing up in the national parliament, or at least we didn't in Britain, and saying, because I am an atheist, uh, or because I am a <laughs> humanist, because of my beliefs, I reject the idea of equal treatment uh, for uh, same-sex couples or gay people. You get people standing up who talk about their religious beliefs, their beliefs in terms of what other people should be doing because of their uh, own convictions, and they base it on religion. Um, that is the source and focus of opposition to the extension of rights uh, in Europe today. Happily, Unlike religiously inspired homophobia in other countries in the world, it infrequently leads uh, to death, which is a good thing for us. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it creates and perpetuates uh, feelings of hostility. So if religious people can change their religions uh, from the inside, um, that's all to the good, and I hope that they uh, succeed. My objection to uh, religion personally is not that it's homophobic or not homophobic, I just don't believe it's true. Um, so, in fact, what interpretation uh, they give to their texts is uh, irrelevant to me, but I hope they find a good one. <laughs> it's nice if they can uh, find an interpretation uh, that doesn't lead uh, groups and individuals to lobby governments um, either to persecute or to condemn or to kill uh, gay people in Europe and around the world. And I'm happy to discuss that too. Like every humanist organization, we value the humanist, the human value, the rights, the human rights, so with the human values. Human values that are equality, individual choice, solidarity, tolerance. So towards homosexuality, 
we are tolerant. If two people want to have sex together, if two people love each other, then we are tolerant to towards it. We have to respect it because it's their choice, if it's a choice. But so I'd like to come back on Anna Karin because she said something very interesting, and I thought to put it in a context, it's very important to do that. Um, first of all, I think it's very courageous that she is here and that she is very progressive for um, a religion too. Um, but and like she said, she, like she said, um, I hope change in religion is possible. But I don't know if that's possible. But that's not to me to decide. That's to the religions to do. But for example, at one time she said something about in the past other religions uh, or other societies. Um, and also, um, it was not possible because of procreation, correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, uh, because of procreation, they had to uh, uh, ban homosexual relations, but that's not true, that's not the case. Um, you see, in different areas of the world... I didn't say that. Okay. I said it was in agricultural societies where there is a lot of struggle for survival. Mm -hmm. okay. There is no space for the individual, <coughs> as in a Western society where you have food on the table and you have shelter and <coughs> everything and you have uh, <coughs> welfare provisions. That, that, it's okay, the because my five, my yeah. five, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to make the most of it. <laughs> no, but that's very important. It has okay. not to do with procreation, okay. it has to do with the survival struggle. But that there is no space for the individual freedom okay. in the same way. Okay, but going on to that, there are religions that Christianity, Islamic religion have a moral, a moral context, a moral value system, and that value system for homosexuality to, throughout the world and throughout history said that homosexuality was not um, sodom, sodomy, like you said before, was not natural. There are other systems, like Taoism or Confucianism, that do not abandon homosexual completely. So there are religions or philo philosophies that do not abandon it completely. Maybe it's not in the open, but they don't abandon it. So that's the first thing I want to say, that there's something strange going on with the Christian Islam Islamic religions. And the second thing I want to say by that, because you, you said a story about Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's true, yeah, like you said, it's the story of Lot. Uh, the reason why homosexuality by so long, by all those centuries, was um, forbidden. But what do we do, you're not from the Islam, but what do we do with something like the Hadith, where the words of the Prophet, who, are written down, who, who were written down centuries after the Prophet died, and there it says literally that homosexuals just have to be dead. So, you, I hope religions can change, but is it possible, for example, maybe you can't speak for Islam, you can only speak for your own church probably, um, but maybe there's no change possible. I don't know, I hope there's change possible, but maybe it isn't because there it's written literally, and how can you be as a Muslim, homosexual if it's written down literally in a book that you follow. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I can't to that. Uh, now we will have some uh, questions going here in the panel and we for about uh, 15 minutes that's what we have left. And uh, I, I actually have two, two short questions for Taslim and Anna Karin, and then I'm happy to hear you ask each other also things. Um, <coughs> the, the question to Taslima first, I'll take both questions first and then you can answer. The question to Taslima is, do you find there's a connection or correlation between oppression of homosexuality and oppression of women? Because if you look in the statistics, it always goes hand in hand. And, if you could comment a little bit on that. And the question to Anna Karin is, uh, I actually agree with uh, very much of what you said before. Um, the, you know, maybe it's a misunderstanding as well, because humanists have no problem at all with people believing in God. We only have problem when uh, these people expect it to affect other people. So that is the problem, so to speak, not the actual belief in God. That's not a problem. But when people 
think and or expect that their belief in God should affect other people, then it's a problem for humanists. And um, my question is rather, um, I mean, the, the very liberal theology that you stand for, for example, is of course, from a humanistic perspective, much, much better than the more fundamental theology. But the problem is that um, Christendom, for example, Christianity, I mean, in the world, is very different from your liberal theology. I mean, if you look at sort of the mainstream Christianity in the world, it is very oppressive. And that is the Christianity we as humanists has to sort of respond to. Uh, if all Christianity was like your theology, then we probably wouldn't have so much to do in the, in the humanist <laughs> movement. But that is not the case, and we sort of have to, to realize that. Uh, I'd like to hear your comment on that. And, there is actually only one thing that I really don't understand in your little paper here, and you say that atheism is as dangerous as religions. Mm -hmm. mm, atheism is not an ideology. Uh, I, I mean, Stalin and Hitler might have been atheists, but they, they could have been vegetarians or men with moustaches. It has nothing to do with, with what they did. The problem with them was that they were communists and, and Nazis, not, not atheists. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you think about that, and I'll start with the question to Taslima. I think that uh, religion is patriarchy and uh, it, the s patriarchal system is to uh, oppress women and women would be property of men. So women's rights, so that we see that religion and women's rights cannot coexist. So religion and uh, and other things also mm, cannot coexist, like human rights, freedom of expression. And uh, homosexuals uh, also cannot you know, give anything to a patriarchal system. So that I think that uh, religion is homophobic as well as misogynist. So, because human rights, so homosexuals and women, homosexual rights and women's rights, actually there there is no space in religion for homosexual rights, and because religion is patriarchy. So I think that the main reason is that. Okay, I see. Anna Karim, would you like to respond as well? Mm -hmm. I say like Obama, he is very present now in our thoughts that we are for change. <laughs> change. We are for change. And yeah. uh, I really agree with you. Change is needed, desperately needed. And I also believe that misogyny and homophobia goes well together. And actually, I believe that we need to perceive the highest value in life which in the monotheistic religion is called God. We have to perceive God as also as a woman, as female, and much more than that, if there shall be any real change. Um, when it comes to, um, to um, your way of uh, distinguishing between people's atheism and people's politics and so on. It reminds me of how many church people uh, say that, well, but my religion, there is no wrong in that. Uh, the Crusades, that was a misinterpretation of religion. And I am not arguing that. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm willing to take responsibility for that my tradition has been very cruel and is very cruel too but I want to change it. Okay. I, I don't want to demonize it, and I don't want to make things look like it was possible to avoid responsibility and brokenness in this world. Okay. My reason for religion is that it's a language, like a poetry, for the brokenness of the human body. And uh, then you have to also take responsibility for the bad parts. Mm. And the more people that take responsibility, the more we can change. I think we completely agree then. We need internal critique and external critique. 
we need internal critique within the religions and we need humanistic critique from outside. Yes, Can yes, please. And I then Barbara. Does this work? I no, think it doesn't. It doesn't. Work. Okay, well, okay. I think there is one problem here, though, because, I mean, um, it's all very well uh, to say one of the solutions uh, to uh, the homophobia of these religious traditions is to say we will interpret, we will reinterpret, we will offer an alternative interpretation, and the alternative interpretation will say it wasn't because the people of Sodom wanted to molest the angels that came to Lot, it was that they were being unneighborly or unfriendly to the angels who came to visit Lot, and that's the interpretation we'll give it, um, and so we say save the tradition uh, from homophobia. But I don't see how, uh, how that claim, the claim that we should change religion rather than get rid of it, in a sense, which was, that's not my uh, dichotomy, that's the, the one that uh, Anna Karin set up. Okay. She said, we'd rather uh, change religion than discard it. Because even if you have evolved this alternative interpretation, the other interpretation will still be possible. There will still be people who give a different interpretation, the same interpretation, the old interpretation to these things. Whereas if you face uh, uh, the world as it is and say homosexual behavior is perfectly natural, it is observed throughout nature, you observe it through human societies, there have always been people who have uh, behaved in the way we do and loved the way we do. If you then say that um, if this action doesn't cause suffering to other people but only increases the happiness uh, of the individuals involved, why shouldn't we allow it? It doesn't hurt anybody. If you face the situation from from that way, from a rational way, looking at the world as it is, um, rather than relying on interpretation and reinterpretation of an ancient text, you close off forever the possibility um, that homophobia might emerge in that way. Whereas if you leave yourself with a text, you're always susceptible to the fact that in a few hundred years, someone will reinterpret again um, and start a new oppression. Because these texts were written hundreds of years ago, some of them a couple of thousand years ago, they totally are unrepresentative of modern life in every way. Yes, uh, I, I would like to respond to that. Uh, you seem to think that there is some kind of uh, final destination as it is for the nuclear waste. Uh, they are trying to find a place where you can hide it for millions. And you are trying to find that place for religion. But as it's already out in the air and the ghost is out of the, of the bottle, it's no longer possible to put it in again. And that's what I hear you say you would like to do. But it's out there. The texts are there. They are spread around the world. So you have to deal with them. There is no slutförvaring för uh, religion. Uh, but uh, you have to deal with it. You, it can always <laughs> pop up. And it's exactly because it always can pop up again as you need to have a very strong internal critique and say that damned thing we don't give a uh, when when i was young my mother said that uh, when i was taking the bible literally and said that saint paul says that those who are drinkers cannot inherit the reign of god i came to my mother as a very newly converted biblicist and said but what do we do with the mr svensson and, and, and uh, my mother said, Anna Coyne, in this house, we don't think about Paul. <laughs> I, I think the modern churches have a responsibility to help people to interpret the, uh, the Bible rightly and not to uh, lean on things written a couple of thousand years ago. The Moses book was, uh, you know, uh, up in the air uh, when, when uh, I was dealing with the partnership. But then... I think uh, if we are going to to reach the goal with equal rights and, and get rid of homophobia, um, religion is one thing. But in Sweden, it was very important that um, uh, there were people, actors, writers, uh, people in public offices who gave homosexuality a, a face. That uh, showing that they were ordinary people from uh, uh, all fields uh, and, and lived together with someone of the same sex. And that made people think, well, ordinary. they are ordinary people. I, I don't have to be afraid for them. Uh, so so uh, there are many things uh, behind why we are as far as we are in Sweden. Sonny? Um, this is better. Um, I don't think religion will go away. Probably, 
it's, it's not necessary. If individuals want to choose a religion or want to believe, that's their case. That's their choice, I mean. But what we can do, and you see that on the map, and that's why you saw it on the map, um, in states where there is a separation between religion and um, state, there you have more possibilities, like in Belgium, like in Sweden, like in the Scandinavian countries, like in Holland, like in Spain, to have more to positive attitudes towards homosexual laws, towards homosexuals. Secondly, I think that um, critical thinking, another humanist value, is very important when people have an education and when people can get arguments, then they can think about it and then maybe um, they, do, they are not afraid anymore of things they don't know or they don't understand. Um, I agreed with uh, Andrew, what he said, and I think that uh, you cannot change religion you have to get rid of religion. Religion will not give you equality and justice because religion was not made for equality and justice. And uh, Quran says that men are superior and women are inferior. How would you interpret it? It says clearly men are superior and women are inferior. And what he said, the religion will not, no, uh, never go away. I don't agree with that. Because if ignorance go away, then religion will go away. The people who believe in religion, because they have fear of God, fear of death, they are ignorant. And you know, in Europe, once upon a time, church ruled Europe, and uh, women were burned at stake. And now it stopped because secularization was possible. So if we secularize the Islamic states, I think that ignorance will go away if we spread, instead of religious education, if we spread secular education, it is possible that people will have education of science, people will ask questions, and criticism must be allowed in the countries where uh, they are not allowed now. If criticism is possible, is allowed in, in, uh, in the Islamic State, I think that soon people will start asking questions and they will, they will be changed. People have to be changed, you cannot change the thousands of years, those dogma, those dogmas will be the historical documents. So you have to change people's mind. Give them modern ideas, give them secular ideas, give them scientific ideas, logic, make them, uh, give them the logical thinking, free thinking. They will be changed and there will be no problem for women's oppression. There will be no problem of of homophobia, people will, you know, live with their rights. Thank you. Just to, just to, just to take up the point as well about the, uh, the, the idea that religion will always be with us uh, in Europe or around the world, well, at the moment, there ha is and has been for, for many decades a dramatic decline in the religiosity of Europe, which continues, I mean, in, in a sense, uh, discussions about... Uh, you know, churches reforming or becoming more liberal in Europe are a footnote to the total uh, falling out of the bottom of, of religion uh, in the continent. It is sort of slowly disappearing and the rate is declining. I don't know about Sweden, but in Britain, belief, belonging, everything, not just belonging, but belief um, is falling down. And to say it will always be with us, well, the, 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 the worship of the ancient Egyptian gods lasted for twice as long as Christianity has existed so far, and it's mm. gone. Um, so, I mean, I don't think there's any reason at all to think that religions can't, individual religions and religions generally can't just disappear. Mm. Okay, um, I don't want to wipe them out. I'm just saying that eventually they may well sort of, you know, organically uh, fade away. Bef 
We will quite soon end. And before I give the word to Anna Karin, I, I'd like to send you a, a question before I give you the word. Um, one of the problems in society is, of course, that we give a special respect to religious views compared to political views, for example. Let me just give you one example. We, we have a school, Christian fundamentalist school in Småland that teaches their children that homosexuals should be killed, for example. They told me this personally, uh, uh, the Plymouth Brethren uh, sect. And uh, we, pay, we all pay for it through our mm, tax system. Uh, if it had been a political organization setting up that school, it would never have been allowed with the same views of homosexuality, for example. So how do we handle that problem, that religious standpoints get a special treatment compared to all other standpoints. Åke Gren is another example. Thank you so much for the word, Krista. Um, I hear what you say, Taslima and Andrew. I hear what you say, and I respect that that is your view, but that is not my view. And I represent many, many homosexual, LGBT, transgender people in uh, the religions. And we would like to keep our religions, but we would like to change them. Because we value them in many, many, many ways. Like the poetry of existential life, that there is so much richness to it that we don't want to get rid of it as our cultural heritage. There is also the hotbed of homophobia, oppression and, of women and so on. But uh, we think that there is a mechanism within, within the Christian church for how to keep some texts at the distance while others you read. The Evangelieboken, which is the text that you use for the services, it's not the whole Bible. And it's a very, since early beginning, uh, the church has always tried to make a selection. So some things we like to go down in value and others we uplift. And it's a, it's a deliberate choice. And uh, Taslima, I'm so sorry to hear you say what you say, because you are using the same argument as my worst opponents. They say, you cannot be a priest, you are a woman, you are a lesbian, you are not allowed to be priest because our dogmas cannot change. And I say, our dogmas can change and faith is only alive when it's changing with its societies and cultures. I'd like, I'd like to give the last word to Taslima before we end this session. Always I wonder that why women believe in religion. Men has the reason to believe in religion because religion gives men the power, authority to do anything, whatever they like. But religion does not, no religion gives women any, any, you know, any rights or any freedom. So I think that women uh, must not believe in religion and, uh, uh, you know, but you became priest. Uh, yeah, uh, but you know, many many women in uh, Muslim women that uh, they uh, you know normally mosques do uh, most do not allow uh, women to go to in the oh, sorry to go to uh, to mosques and pray. Only men are allowed to go to mosque and pray. In uh, some countries, women are allowed, women recently are allowed to go to mosque. And they think it is big uh, freedom for women. I think that they go to mosque and pray what? Pray for what? Because this Allah or God does not give any rights to women. So pray to those gods who hate women. And you are, you became a priest, okay, it is the right, but you are praying to God who hates women. No. <laughs>